Uh, yeah, I mean, just to say I'm delighted to be down here, to be involved uh, with the festival, and particularly to talk to Alana Hopkin. Uh, in the 1980s, I was living in England, and it was a very bleak time in many ways. Uh, so I used to read with envy um, the Kinsale Diary, which was published in the English newspaper The Independent and was written by a Kinsale resident, Stan Gebler Davis. I was amazed to read about this small town in County Cork, which was full of characters, <laughs> funny incidents, and famous writers, including uh, Derek Mahan, Desmond O'Grady, Aidan Higgins, and of course, Alana Hopkin. Alana grew up in London. Uh, she studied at Queen Mary College, University of London, and the University of Essex. But in 1982, she moved to Kinsale, which was her mother's hometown. And in 1986, she was introduced to Aidan Higgins by the poet Derek Mahan. Eventually, they moved in together and bought a house on High O'Connell Street and married and spent 29 years together. Aidan died in 2015, and Alana's new book, A Very Strange Man, chronicles the ups and downs of Alana's <laughs> life with Aidan. The reviews of this book have been astonishing. In May, Sebastian Barry called it his book of the year so far. Rob Doyle in the Irish Times said, it's among the richest accounts I've ever read of lives devoted to writing. And in the Sunday Times, Louisa O'Carroll wrote, it may be a memoir about a very strange man, but it is also a story about a very unique woman. So I'm delighted to welcome a very unique woman, Alana Hopkin. Thank you. Thank you, Matthew. <laughs> Thank you. I'm going to talk a little about the genesis of the book. And in fact, it was a great help to me when it began that I heard that Clean and Yanluan of RTE was looking for pieces for a collection called 50 Years of Sunday Miscellany. So I immediately said, keep me 1986, that's the year I met Aidan. And the piece I wrote ended up being the opening of the book. So I'm going to read you the original radio piece because it's shorter and has less detail. That's why I'm reading from another book. Thunderbolt. Where to start? At the beginning, naturally, in 1986, with the Thunderbolt, the coup de foudre. I was 36, living in Kinsale, earning my living as a writer. I had moved to Ireland from London some years before, soon after the publication of my first novel. After some rocky times financially, I had signed a generous contract for a non-fiction book and had no money worries. I enjoyed Kinsale, my mother's hometown, and did not miss London at all. I had a wide circle of friends and a couple of boyfriends, both Dubliners, who visited occasionally. After an intense affair with a married man who broke my heart, and a brief engagement to a man who had an increasingly serious drink problem, I was glad not to be in love, to be footloose and fancy-free captain of my own ship. For some weeks, my friend Derek Mahan had been awaiting the arrival of Higgins, his friend the novelist Aidan Higgins. After many years out of Ireland, Higgins was living in Wicklow, Seamus Heaney had told him that if he returned to Ireland, he could become a founder member of an association of writers and artists called Estona, and the government would give him an annual income, provided he dedicated himself full-time to writing. He was on the next plane, and after a quick visit to Dublin to seal the formalities, he headed for Wicklow, where his brother was living. But after two years, Higgins was not happy in the depths of the country. Derek immediately solved the problem. He should move to Kinsale, which had 23 pubs and plenty of congenial company. He gave Higgins my number as someone who could help him find a cottage with a sea view at a reasonable rent, 
a tall order even in 1986. He rang me one evening. His voice was a pleasant surprise, what you would call an educated voice, more English than Irish and very serious. Definitely the voice of a reader of the Times literary supplement, a man who would know a hawk from a handsaw. Derek asked if I would help him to entertain Higgins. It was late October, but still dry and sunny. Kinsale looked gorgeous in its autumn colors, the gray stone buildings against a blue sea. He's coming down by helicopter, was the latest news, followed next week by no sign of Higgins. Another week went by, then finally some news. Higgins was arriving on Wednesday. Could I join them for dinner? I said I'd meet them in the bar after my swim in the hotel pool. I remember having wet hair and being too impatient to dry it, suddenly curious to see what Higgins looked like. Suppose, I thought idly, he turns out to be someone significant in my life, and his first view of me is of an otter-like wet head. I dismissed this untypical romantic thought from my thoroughly rational mind and headed for the bar. And there he was, in a wine-red sweater, medium-heightened build, long reddish-brown hair, beard, granny glasses, slightly stooped, engaged in close conversation with an enormous Viking called Sven. I remember Sven's handshake almost breaking my bones, while the touch of Aidan's hand was like velvet. Sven was a sea captain, Aidan told me in his extraordinary voice, who had once killed a man in the course of his duties. We dined at the shipwreck, a new place near the hotel. Derek did not drink wine, so Aidan and I agreed on a bottle of Rioja. Derek knew that we were both interested in the writer Malcolm Lowry and introduced this topic. I listened to Aidan explaining a theory a Canadian friend had about Lowry. I liked the way he stood up for his friend's theory against my demolition of it. I liked the way he took me seriously and didn't flirt. Aidan ordered another bottle of Rioja, at which point Derek politely left. We first kissed in the street outside the shipwreck, and Aidan's glasses fell apart. Mine often did the same, and I was able to retrieve the pieces and put them together. Aidan was struck dumb with admiration at this feat. I noticed that his eyes were hazel, exactly the same color as mine. It was like looking into my own soul. The thunderbolt struck. I took his hand and we went back to my house and did not see Derek again until the Saturday. A nice pair was his amused greeting as we knocked contritely on his door. We had come to collect Aidan's things. He was moving in with me. That was 1986, and we were seldom apart until he died holding my hand 29 years later. So I had that piece, and I was off. I had the beginning of the book. The next thing I did was think back to more recent times when Aidan had died in the nursing home in 2015. And I had come straight home at 4.30 in the morning and made some notes. I'm a great note taker, I'm always making notes, but I thought this was really important to get down. So I looked again at what I call my night notebook, which stays beside the bed. And I realized that I had the making of quite a nice ending actually given to me in the notebook. So I wrote the ending, and all that was left was to <laughs> fill in the middle. So that took about two years, and it did involve reading Aidan's diary and notebooks, which I had never looked at while he was alive. And I built up the picture between my diary and notebooks and Aidan's, and just out of interest, this is Aidan's diary entry in full for the same day that I have just described. He'd just arrived in Kinsale and he was staying with Derek. Um, 18th of November, 1986. Aidan writes, 
woke to raised voice, Mahan on the phone to London. I left. Meet at Swedish Chef at midday. Pubs open at 10.30 a.m. into Armada. Mahan swimming at 7 p.m. in New Pool at Hotel, meeting Alana. Armada landlady, English, London Irish, child at bottle. I doze off before coal fire. Hours pass. Soup. Driven out by mixture of radio and TV news, very loud. At hotel bar, met Sven Jensen of Norwegian ship. Derek to pool, more bumping around than swimming due to smallness of pool, he says. Bumperini. Sven, a trout catcher, watcher of fish. We are asked to move, sitting when Derek returns. Then, out of corner of eye, the femme fatale, Alana. Mixture of Hannah Vong and Nula McAllister, old flames of yore. She had been swimming in the hotel swimming pool. I'd seen a photograph of her where she looked like an Italian lesbian. Not that I have ever encountered one. <laughs> the hair at the nape of her neck was damp. I thought she had something of the otter in her. She had the delicateness of a cat, something quiet and feline. The voice pitched low, no discernible Irish accent, certainly not cork. Skin, drinking red wine, survives bone-crushing handshake from Sailor Sven, who wants to be marine biologist. Shipwreck wine bar for 8 p.m., follow Alana. Place run by Englishman Jeff and Galway wife. Music off. A kitten and a red setter by turf fire. Derek departs as others arrive. Three Spaniards, Angel and Amigos, banter in Spanish with Alana, buying lobsters for export. We drink at counter. Cuban cigars. Out car, undecided. Lens falls from left eye. Alana fixes. Stay until 3 a.m. Back to her place. House shared with four or five smelly cats and American piano tuner. Encountered already in Swedish chef. Undressed her. She, me. Say 4 a.m. Long dalliance, darkness. Thank goodness for his discretion. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. Um. Thank, thanks for that, Alana. <laughs> um, I was just wondering about those times. I mean, yes. as I say, I was reading them about them in Stan Gabler Davis's That's articles. right. He gave some. He made some wonderful stories out of it. He did. He did. Could, could you tell us a, a little bit more about those particular times in Kinsale? Yes, it was sort of an accident that we were all there at the same time, and Stan was very much passing through, I think, mm -hmm. though he intended to settle. He was very much a news journalist, and it was yeah. never going to suit him long term. So, um, I don't know, it was, the bars were so welcoming, and Desmond O'Grady had his headquarters in the Spaniard. Yeah. I drank in the Bullman, because it was next door to my house, and... Um, the Armada became very important because of the landlady Maureen Tierney, who was very welcoming to artists and other impecunious people, and you could perhaps get a bit of a loan if you were uh, running out of money towards the end of the week. So, um, And there were other people. There was an American called Howard R. Simpson who wrote for the Sacramento Bell and wrote not very good thrillers, but they were fun. Yeah. And who else? Oh, um, People passing through because of the Hawhi tax exemption yeah. law. Robert Nye, who wrote a wonderful book about um, Falstaff, yeah. among other things, and much very good poetry. He'd just moved there in the last mm -hmm. couple of years, so it was accidental. And the, 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 the very first Kinsale Arts Festival, of course, started <laughs> around that time too. Yes, that was the next year, 87. Yeah. And it was just, I think it was an extension of pub talk and yeah. people thought it would be fun to invite their friends to read in Kinsale, make a few bob, 
have a couple of nice nights in a B&B and um, a bit of fun. And so, because there were how many members of Ace Dorna? Desmond, Aidan, Derek, mm. that's enough, you mm. know. Um, mm. It wasn't so much organized as it sort of organically happened. And there were terrible disasters. It was meant to take place in a venue that didn't serve alcohol because we thought alcohol and poetry maybe wouldn't mix very well. It was the <laughs> so we, yeah, it was yeah. the, 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 fish, the hall, fishermen's yeah. hall, even. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, which was built by the Methodists for hymn singing. Mm. And on the night in question, I'm afraid I was in charge and I couldn't find the key. It had completely gone missing and there was no way we could get in past this huge padlock. So we were in the Armada pub saying, oh God, what are we going to do now? And the obvious thing was to have it in the pub. Yeah. So the landlord said very sternly, get those poets out of my bar by nine o'clock. And <laughs> when he realized how much poets drank, he <laughs> changed his tune. So, so it was a huge success. And... Uh, Happened again slightly more, in a slightly more organised way the following year. Yeah, yeah. So. And uh, you mentioned uh, the pubs in Kinsale, which are, of course, very important to writers. Yes. Um, <laughs> and I think you have a section in the book you were going to read from about a particular place. Yes, I'll, I'll do yeah. that now. Yeah. It's, um, the book is becoming famous in Kinsale because it includes an account of a place called the Captain's Cabin, which is a kind of legendary drinking Okay, so it's about Aidan and I settling back into our working life, which once we'd met, we just sort of moved in together and picked up the strings of what we'd been doing before we met. And he left Wicklow and we found a little apartment and he found his way around town. So Aidan had also made friends in a bar known as the Captain's Cabin a late-night drinking den in a back street behind Acton's hotel, known jokingly as the bad part of town. It was run by a colourful man originally from Cornwall, Tom Menhinnick, generally known as Mad Tom, and his beautiful but contrary wife, Miranda. It did not have a spirits licence or a beer licence and was officially a restaurant. Mainly, people bought wine by the bottle, Sometimes ribs or steaks were grilled over an open fire, but generally there was little food and much drinking. Because it opened late, it was popular with staff from the town's restaurants. Kinsale had more than half a dozen bistro-style restaurants, mainly run by owner chefs, unusual in 1986. So the crowd in the cabin, as it was known, tended to be well-traveled and cosmopolitan, exactly to Aidan's taste. He enjoyed the banter between Tom and Miranda, June Pope's lovely smile, and discovered a couple who had lived for a while in Nerche, where Aidan had lived in the 1960s. There were the Spanish lads who were trading in lobsters, a Breton fisherman, Jean-Marie, who both caught and exported shrimp, and a big blonde, Pat Omani, a larger-than-life character who lived a couple of doors away in a house called Foxwell, Try pronouncing that in a Northumberland accent. <laughs> Pat, like many people who gravitated to Kinsale, was a versatile worker. She could run a restaurant as chef, manager, waitress, or all three. And she was also a hairdresser. A plain-spoken woman, she told Aidan his beard needed trimming and his hair was a disgrace. She would come over the next day at five. How do you know where we live? Everyone knows where you live, darling. The lovebirds of the Dutch house. <laughs> so the Dutch house was um, an old... It's still there. It's an old building with a, an apartment on each floor and a very narrow, rickety staircase up. And we were delighted to find an apartment empty. And it, there was a little sea view out of the back window, even. And there was a coin-operated payphone in the hall of the Dutch house which we shared with the occupants of the two other apartments, Stan Gabriel Davis on the ground floor, Kinsale is a very small town, and a musician called Frank Buckley in the middle. Frank made wine, and a great waft of fermenting matter belched out of his front door whenever it opened. 
He had a piano in his apartment and gave private lessons to beautiful young singers. On weekdays, he taught music in the local school, and on Saturdays, he conducted the music for weddings, and on Sundays, the church choir. No wonder he was usually seen running, briefcase in one hand, car keys in the other, coattails flying out behind him as he made his way from one engagement to the other. Aidan noted in his diary at this time, Buck leaping downstairs, humming where the mountains of Morn sweep down to the sea after 30 minutes piano of same. Frank also composed, and there was always a pile of handwritten music manuscripts behind the front door, as if Haydn had been working on his symphony. So that was Kinsale. And um, it rather, it, it amused me, it frightened me, and it delighted me that within three days of knowing each other, Aidan was talking about us buying a house together. And I thought, well, <laughs> you, you're kind of decisive there. Let's give it like a few months to make sure we still like each other. And we did. And so we went about um, trying to buy a house, which was not as easy as we had thought. But we managed. And um, we, we, yeah, we, we had moved in together. Mm -hmm just over a year after meeting each other. Yeah. Hearing so. those um, stories about the, the Dutch house and mm. Captain's Cabin, um, uh, as I said to you yesterday, it's one of my big regrets is that yes. I arrived in Kinsale in 1990 and missed the heyday of the <laughs> Captain's Cabin, but I've heard so many stories about it, I feel I oh, was yeah. there. Um, I was a bit unfair to it. They did do baked potatoes as well, which <laughs> were often a lifesaver. So. And what, what, what changes have you seen in the town in, uh, since those oh, days? Oh, it's, yeah. it's, it's enormous, mm. and yet it still doesn't seem to have spoilt it. No. I mean, in those days, there were derelict Georgian houses. There were little bits of the town that were all overgrown, as in, in this time of year. Mm. And there were some real bargains to be had if you could buy property. And there were potholes in the street and mud. There was one very small supermarket and two what we used to call gombean men shops. I don't think they, they use that expression anymore. There was very little choice. If you wanted an avocado, you had to go to Cork, basically. It was that kind of place. And hardly anyone had a phone and hardly anyone had a car. So um, it was quieter. But, you know, nowadays, I think... It's still a very nice mix of people. And some of the people who've moved to Kinsale never come into Kinsale at all. They get their food delivered from Tesco. Yeah. They go to restaurants somewhere else. So, um, and then, of course, the Kinsale College has been a huge yeah. um, benefit to the town because that teaches permaculture yeah. and art and media studies. And you get really interesting people coming along, as opposed to, to the very wealthy ones who never come into town. They're all over the place, and they've made a big difference with planting edible window boxes and that kind of thing. So it's still a nice mix, mm. but different. And I live in the center of town, and I think the one that most affects me is the increase in traffic. But that's only, you know, it's sort of May to September. Mm. And it's not too bad the rest of the year. So I still like it. I wouldn't live anywhere else. Mm. I remember hearing that the landlord of the Dutch house was famous for not <laughs> giving back people's deposit. Absolutely. <laughs> but apparently Derek Mahan barricaded himself in his room <laughs> until he got his deposit back. So did he, <laughs> yeah. yeah. He took over our house when we finally bought one. Derek moved into our little apartment. Mm. And it's, Kinsale has three churches in the centre of town and a town clock. And I saw Derek the morning after his first night in the house looking very haggard, and he said, you didn't tell me about the bells. <laughs> <laughs> so that was that. Um, I think, yeah, at that time, we were both travelling quite a lot, yeah. and we had an unexpected trip to Dublin. So I thought, oh, yes, you were going how to... We do? Yeah, yeah do, maybe yeah. to get us out of Kinsale. Yeah, OK. Um, because of the shared telephone in the Dutch house, 
I sometimes answered calls that were meant for Stan, and we both wrote for the Mail on Sunday magazine, though Stan wrote for it a lot more often than I did. So I picked up the phone on a, a morning in mid-June, and it was You magazine looking for Stan, asking him to go to Dublin to interview a cartoon animator. And I happily said, Stan's not here, why don't you try me? <laughs> and I got the job. And it was um, great fun because it meant dropping everything and driving up to Cork and getting the evening train to Dublin. And Aidan decided to come with me. So this is extracts from account of, an account of that trip to Dublin in 1987. I had booked a room at the Clarence, which before it was bought by U2 and given a boom time makeover, was a slightly shabby and pleasantly old-fashioned hotel, much favoured by Colchis, being roughly midway between Houston Station, where trains from Cork and Galway arrived, and the city centre. I loved its Art Deco facade on the Liffey and had been determined to stay there at some point. Now, thanks to the Mail on Sunday, I could. Up to then, I had never been in the front door of the Clarence, only the back one, on a dingy cobbled street in Temple Bar, which led to its panelled back bar, where the Irish Times literary editor, Brian Fallon, hosted a monthly sandwich lunch for his contributors. It was mainly attended by older men, a group that one of my writer friends referred to as the crypto-fascists. Among the changing faces, Benedict Kiley, James Plunkett, Tony Cronin, and Tony O'Riordan, a local history buff, were regulars. I wasn't sure if the label referred to their politics or was an in-joke that I didn't get. To me, they were simply a group of interesting characters who enjoyed talking about books and sharing literary gossip. So at the time of that trip, it was 16th of June, Bloomsday, and the crypto-fascists were meeting in the back bar of the Clarence. No one was planning to attend any of the Bloomsday events, which were dismissed as all rubbish. The choice was between a discussion between Anthony Cronin and Francis Stewart in the early evening, or a dramatized reading of Molly Bloom's soliloquy later on. The idea dreamt up between the Tourist Board and the Arts Council of making a big fuss about Bloomsday on the 16th of June, the day described in Ulysses, which they pronounced Ulysses rather than Ulysses, as I had always done, was never going to catch on, they said. The projected annual celebration of Joyce's novel was dismissed as doomed to failure. For a start, hardly anyone read it these days. It was terribly overrated. The conversation turned to more interesting topics. And we see in the course of the book how wrong they were, as I keep ending up in Dublin on Bloomsday for one reason or another. We had an early supper at Nico's, a rather ordinary Italian restaurant in Dame Street. Ulick O'Connor was eating there alone, and Aidan, who knew him but didn't like him, carefully chose a table that was out of his sight line. This was just as well, because on a previous visit to Dublin to attend a book launch in the Shelburne Hotel, hosted by my then publisher, Hamish Hamilton, Ulick had threatened the English writer Robert Nye, a fellow Hamish Hamilton author I had run into on the Dublin train, with fisticuffs for taking advantage of Charlie Hawkey's tax exemption scheme. He very nearly knocked Robert down the stairs, Alarmed at this unprovoked aggression from an apparent madman, being unaware of Ulick's reputation as a sportsman and respected author, Robert and I jumped straight into a taxi and returned to Houston Station for the last train back to Cork. After the meal, Aidan and I walked up to Stevens Green and he showed me the garden for the blind, which he had been telling me about the previous week. I thought it was a wonderful idea, a garden that you could smell and touch with plant labels in Braille. The reality was much smaller than I expected, a square enclosure with just one wooden bench, heavily scented by lavender, the only flower in bloom. But it was nice that he had remembered to show it to me. 
As we left the green, Aidan pointed out the place where he had once seen Siobhan McKenna feeding the ducks. He was in awe of her beauty on stage, but said that in person, her features were too big for conventional beauty. They were best seen from the middle of the stalls. Whenever he mentioned her, he recalled her having to be restrained from throwing himself into Michal McLeamore's grave, which seemed to Aidan the height of romance. She had died aged 63 the previous November, a few days before Aidan and I met. There was a kind of magic in walking across the green in the long summer evening with someone who had so many memories of Dublin, gazing at the bright lights of the stately Shelburne Hotel. We didn't cross over to the hotel, but continued on the same side of the street to a bar called the Pembroke Lounge. Soon after we had settled with our drinks, I noticed a small, untidy man come in the emergency exit and stand there swaying to and fro, staring around the room. He was greeted warmly by Aidan as Michael Hartnett. As soon as the poet started talking, his appearance and insobriety were forgotten and I was riveted. He told us he was translating the poems of the Spanish mystic St. John of the Cross into both Irish and English at the same time, if I understood correctly. He had a new collection coming out in July, a necklace of wrens. We must come to the launch. He asked after Derek Mann and said, he was the best around, the best poet, presumably. He left soon after with a distracted air, saying that he hadn't meant to stop. He was looking for someone who owed him money. We moved on for one drink at the Horseshoe Bar in the Shelburne, feeling the need of a little luxury on what had turned into a cold, rainy evening. So that was yeah. Dublin at the time. Yeah, yeah. The, the, the book, by its nature, obviously, being a memoir, is, is very personal and mm. reveals a, a lot about Aidan, but it also reveals quite a lot about yourself, too. I mean, <laughs> was that something that you intended? or did it? No, it, it only happened as I went along. That mm. there, there was a moment when I realised that unless I tell more than I actually want to, unless I tell the truth, mm -hmm. there's no point in doing this book. It'll only work if I use my own diaries as freely as I would use Aidan's. Yeah. So, yes, um, there's a lot more in it than I had expected. But in my opinion, I did try to keep it only enough that you can follow the story. Yeah. I didn't want to go too deeply <laughs> Did you find anything. A, a cathartic process? I mean, particularly I'm thinking of... Was it hard to write about Aidan's decline, for instance? Um, that stopped me. A couple of, I had a couple of false starts. Mm. I started too early, and then I started and realised I needed to see Aidan's papers, which were by then in Austin, Texas. And I was lucky enough that I saw an application for fellowships in the TLS, and I knew the director of the Harry Ransom Centre, Steve Ennis, yeah through Derek. So I wrote to him directly and said, is there any point in me applying for a fellowship as I'm not an academic, but I want to read Aidan's papers? And he got straight back to me by email the next day saying, I can give you a fellowship. Will a month be long enough? So wow. that was great. And um, once I'd done that, I remember my last two days in the library, I'd kind of gone through all the boxes enough and I said well right take advantage of this time and try and plan the book yeah. what on earth are you going to do when you get home having had this lovely treat and that was when I mapped out originally three sections and there were the good times the difficult times and the impossible times yeah, yeah. and in fact the editor I worked with then encouraged me to refine that to four sections and to make the final one about the impossible times much shorter. Mm -hmm. But cathartic, yes, it was. And it was also like a refresher course, because I hadn't thought about the good times at the beginning when we did all sorts of things like go to the Aran Islands and uh -huh. did a bit of a tour of uh, Northwest Ireland, and we had a trip to Nerka together. And I hadn't thought about these good times during the 13 years of Aidan's decline. It was a 
a long, slow stop-start decline. And mm. actually, Matthew was one of the key people who... He was the only person in the end Aidan would allow in the house and talk to. All his other friends were dropped. He felt as he lost mental capacity that he didn't want to be with the people he was with before. But somehow Matthew could come and read to him and talk to him one-to-one -one very gently and he'd be happy. So. Yeah, we, I, I remember <laughs> he used to yeah, come and he would... <laughs> uh, pour me a, a gin and tonic, and I, as I said before, as, as his <laughs> eyesight got worse, the gin and tonics got <laughs> e ever bigger uh, until there was actually no tonic in one yes. of them. Uh, it was completely gin, and I had a very... Uh, Matthew was up for it, though. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah, I did drink it, but uh, it was yeah. a, I had a very difficult walk back home later on. Just um, to explain briefly, Aidan lost his sight due to macular degeneration, and then he became a victim to vascular dementia. Mm. And eventually, it was impossible for one person to look after him at home. So the last three years of his life were spent in a nursing home. So that's a summary of the, yeah. the three next parts. Yeah, so. yeah. Um, it might be an, an opportunity now to, to see if anyone uh, in the audience would like to ask a question. Uh, is that... Sure. <laughs> Uh, we have a, a roving mic, I, oh, think, yes. I think is what they're called. Is there anyone else here who's tried memoir writing? That might be an interesting... No. <laughs> no. <laughs> well. <laughs> yes. Yes. It up in, um, <laughs> in oh sorry I'm not allowed to touch it um, <laughs> in the Bantry bookshop later on I think they're open until two is that right and until three on a great. Sunday which is great and uh, so but I've read a lot about the book and you know various of the reviews and and that sort of thing and even the pieces that you've read there now today it's just it was such a male world oh yes um, and I just wonder could you talk a, a bit about that there seem to be no women um, um, I forgot to mention Nula Nigonal. She okay. was there. Right. Um, and Ellen Beardsley, I suppose. But yes, it was very male dominated. It really was. And it, it's never bothered me one way or another. I just do what I do. But um, it, it's a good observation, yes. Mm -hmm. um, who else is there? Uh, no, the whole literary thing. You know, I was thinking particularly those the, the Irish Times contributors. Yeah. There were some women. There was Eta Daly, I think, and Eilish Dillon was still alive. And um, not Mary Lavin. I think she died by then. Mm. But there just were not that many women writers. And, you know, Eilish Negrivny has just edited a book. What's it called? Here Come the Women? Or... Look, a woman writer, I think that's what it's called. And that is people my age, roughly, who were writing in Ireland at that time. And they're just describing the way they got into writing and, and what the thing was like. So, so, yes, it's not my fault, but there just were not many, many women around. And were you ever uncomfortable about that? No. Did you not notice it? No, I, I never... Um, it was just colleagues, you know, and whether they were men or women didn't really matter. Okay. And I can't think of any... Oh, there was a woman in, in a Shannon called Alice Taylor who was published her first book at that time, and I interviewed her. And she was fascinating because she came from a farming background and had then run a post office mm. and started writing just out of love of it. Mm. And she's still going, and she's wonderful. So, you know, the women were unusual, I suppose. Yeah. yeah, good question, though. How long, how far we've come, I hope. Yeah. yeah. So. Hmm. Oh, Carberry. <laughs> Hi, Alana. I listened to your interview on RT Arena. Oh, uh, yes. Yes, and it was such a fantastic interview, as is this one. Uh, and I was just wondering, did you both ever run your writing past each other? Ah, yeah, there's a whole section <laughs> about that. Um, I never show anyone what I'm working on until it's pretty well finished. And Aidan was the same. And sometimes when he was writing two very long and complicated stories under some pressure, he asked me to help him 
edit them. Um, that was Sodden Fields and another one called The Bird I Fancied, which the feminists objected to the title of. It's a London thing, you know, to call a woman bird. In a, I don't see it as demeaning, but... <laughs> anyway, um, no is the short answer, but then... I hadn't read all of Aidan's work when we first met, and he hadn't read any of mine. And he very much didn't like my first novel, which was okay. He read it up to page 67, and he said, not interesting. <laughs> I, you know, I knew the difference between our work, and I knew him well enough to respect him for not pretending he liked it. I mean, that's fine. But then he wrote my second novel, which is the one that Derek Mann liked very much while I was in London. And he started um, running it down in front of my friends. And I thought that was very bad behavior, and I told him so. And that would have been like our first major row, I think, you know. Aidan, you just don't do things like that. And okay for you not to like it, but don't go around telling everyone why you don't like it uh, behind my back. Mm -hmm. So the pattern was set of fairly frank exchanges. But no, um, I, I helped with these stories. I went to London that time, and the story called The Bird I Fancied was 30 pages long, and when I came back, it was 90 pages long. <laughs> so some cutting had to be done. And it's often helpful to have another eye if you're working that closely on something under great heat. So that was the only time, really. And then, you know, I didn't like some of his novels as well. I didn't like, I don't like Lions of the Grunewald. Mm -hmm. Whereas Tomi Ungura, the late of this parish, thought it was one of Aidan's best pieces of work. So we live with these <laughs> differences of opinion. W was there ever, ever any sense of competitiveness? Not on my part, no. 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 But as he got older and as he, his sight got feebler, he kept saying to me every now and then, you're winning, <laughs> 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 in the sort of humorous yeah. way, but yeah. I know what he meant. Yeah. Like I, I was still doing things, and he by yeah. then wasn't. Because yeah. yeah. he was 87 when he died, which yeah. is a fair age. And there was a 23-year age difference. So shall I wrap up, if yeah. there are? Yeah, I, don't I just thought I'd it. read the end of the first part so that we, we part on a positive note. <laughs> 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 right, so this is... Um, a year after Aidan and I have met, we've bought a house, and at last, we're about to move in. We had our housewarming party at 12.30 p.m. the next day. Nearly everyone we knew came along, or so it seemed. Tomas brought a bottle of black bushmills, which he then proceeded to drink. Not a good idea. Desmond O'Grady came with Ellen, heavenly pregnant, and two small dogs. Catherine and Joachim brought their children who explored the garden. Stan Gabler Davis remarked that the house move had made my hair turn grey. In fact, I was experimenting. It was meant to look distinguished. The gallant Peter Murray commented, Stan is one of the rudest men I've ever met, and I agreed. When the drink ran out, we went down to Jim Edwards with the stragglers and drank one last toast to our new home. On Monday, Aidan's diary notes that he picked up the first post in Two Higher Street, had a radox bath listening to a robin caroling in garden, jackdaws and crows in dispute or accord among the roof tiles and chimney pots. We were both surprised by the difference it made having a house and a garden of our own, being homeowners for the first time. A whole world of domesticity suddenly took on a new interest. We spent hours wandering around hardware shops, tile shops, carpet showrooms, garden centers, and paint shops, even the homeware department of Dunn stores, none of which had hitherto held any attraction. We both found enormous pleasure in the house, in owning it together, cleaning it together, decorating it together, buying things for it together. Aidan was reading the letters of Freya Stark and found a quote that he liked. There is a mysterious pleasure in owning a scrap of earth far greater than any other possession. I wonder why. So that's what we found out. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Thank you.
Thanks.